If you look at the reference, you can see that the character bounces a little between poses. So we add these movements first. I'll highlight the common back controller and move to a frame somewhere between the first and second poses. For example, the third. And shift it up to the Y axis in measured coordinates. You can see that a key appeared, and notice that it was created only to move along the Y axis. Sometimes it's useful to set the keys for all channels, and you can do it by pressing the shortcut S on the keyboard. Or select the desired channels and click Key Selected in the right click menu in the channel box. You can set the auto keyframe behavior to create keys on all attributes at once. In Preferences, choose Animation in the Auto Key section. I think I'll leave it exactly as it is. And add a second jump between the second and third poses. For editing movements, it's easy to use the Graph Editor a tool designed for editing animation curves. It displays graphs of channel changes over time for selected objects. The point on the curve shows the key, and the curve itself shows how the channel changes over time between keys. You can change the curve, namely the interpolation, with these buttons or by manipulating the tangents. You can edit the amplitude of the movement by shifting the keys for several phases at once. You can make these jumps higher or lower. If you want to move the character downwards for the whole animation, you can do so. The keys are shifted with the middle button. And by holding the shift key button, you can limit the keys shift either vertically, thus changing the amplitude of the key, as well as horizontally, which means you can change its time. Look at these stats fields. You can enter a specific frame and the value of the channel size of that key. There are several tools for editing keys. You can shift them or scale. Also by middle mouse button. In this case, the scaling will be relative to the position of the mouse cursor. There are also other tools, such as Region Key Tool or Lattice. I won't describe them in detail. I recommend you to experiment with them on your own. Graph Editor also allows you to copy the keys. For example, you can copy the jumps from the first phase to the second. I select the desired keys, press the shortcut Ctrl C, or select Copy from the menu, go to the frame where the first key of the copied should be, in other words, somewhere between the poses, I press Ctrl V and the same keys have appeared. Now the character bounces in the second phase as well. Perhaps increase the amplitude a little. Something like this. The important point is that the transformation channels in the channel box actually display coordinates in parent space. Accordingly, all the animation curves for transformation also display displacements in parent space. Similar to rotations in the gimbal system, you can animate objects with any orientation of the manipulator axis, in global or local coordinates. But to see the real direction of the axis and understand which curves in the graph editor, as well as which movements they're responsible for, you need to change the axis orientation with the Move tool into Parent, either through the properties of the tool or through the Mark menu in the viewport. By left-clicking while holding down the W key button. Sometimes parent space coincides with world coordinates if the parent controller is oriented along world coordinates, as in this case with the back controller. But in general, when you're working with curves in the graph editor, remember the above and check the direction of axis in parent space. 
If you look at the animation, you can see that the legs behave a bit strangely. They move synchronically and the supporting leg constantly shifts along the floor. I'll make the left leg stay in the same place for a while and then bounce back during the jump. I'll copy the first key for the IK controller of the right leg. That is, the key where the leg is on the floor. Let's say on the third frame, and highlight the controller. Move to the first frame. Click on the third frame with the middle mouse button and press the S key button to record all channels for the controller. Next, I'll make the left foot touch the floor a little earlier to shift the phases of the movements. For this purpose, I'll move the key of the IK controller of the left foot, in which it's lowered to the floor one frame back, from the sixth to the fifth frame. Since the movement is quite fast, I think one frame will be enough. After lowering, the left leg should also stay still for a while, because it's the support leg. Similar to the right leg, I'll copy the IK controller key from the 5th frame to somewhere between the poses, for example to the 9th frame. You can see that now, while jumping during the right leg lift, the position of the left leg changes slightly. It isn't expressive enough for me. That's why I'll correct the position and the rotation in the 11th frame to make the jump more visible. like this. And now I'll repeat the same steps for the second phase. Don't forget that in our animation, the first and last poses should coincide. So if you change the position of the leg on the last frame, the last key will need to be copied to the first frame. In our case, you'll need to copy the first frame for the right leg to the next key, to make sure that the leg is fixed. At this stage, you can probably go back to editing the skinning weights if you didn't do universal skinning earlier. As now, it looks like the heel is coming off the floor due to inaccuracies in the skinning, not due to the controllers. As I mentioned earlier, the idea is to adjust the skinning weights only for the required movements. So I'll adjust them for this animation. Then I'll save the weights to a file, after which I'll load them in the original file with rig, which I'll use as a reference in this animation scene. You need to import the reference into the scene in order to edit the weights, which means to make the rig completely local. Therefore, I'll save this animation scene in order to save the animation on the rig reference. Then I'll save it again as a separate file where I'll edit the weights. I'll name it Dick Weight Paint. And now I import it into the reference and change it by right clicking and selecting the import command. You can see that the blue label on the object icons in Outliner has gone, but the namespace remains. The names of the objects must be completely identical for the correct import and export of the skin weights. In the original file with rig, there was no namespace, so I'll remove it here also. Well, to do this, I open the namespace editor, select the existing namespace, dick, and click delete and then merge with root. You can see that the namespace is removed and now the objects have the common names. For the ease of skinning, to use commands such as mirror skin weights, you need the character to take a neutral pose in any frame. Let this pose be at the beginning, for example, on frame zero. So I'll change the animation range from zero, move to the zero frame. 
select all controllers, for example, through Anim Picker, and then change M gear Anim bits. Apply Smart Reset Attributes or SRT command. It resets transformations and attributes to neutral for selected controllers. You can see that the character has assumed a neutral pose. Just in case, I'll click key all in Anim Picker to record it completely for all attributes. Now we can move on to setting the skin cluster weights. I'll turn on the joints and x-ray displays and hide the controllers to avoid overloading of the viewport. Basically, you can set up all the deformations, but for now, I'll adjust the weights on the shoes. If you plan to adjust weights for the body as well at this point, remember to turn off the Delta Mush deformer so you can clearly see the result of the skin deformer. I talked about skinning tools in the rig lesson, so I won't talk about it in detail now. In the same way I showed earlier, I'll assign a weight equal to one of any joint for selected points, then smooth out or add weight little by little to adjacent joints to smooth out deformations. I'll only adjust the left shoe and then copy the weights to the right side. Unfortunately, the smooth mode for smoothing weights quite often doesn't work correctly in Maya. That's why I recommend you to use the NG Skin Tools plugin for skinning, which I mentioned in the rig lesson, in which smooth works adequately. When you have adjusted the left shoe, we go to frame 0 with a neutral pose and apply the mirror skin weights command. The default values are acceptable to me. I click mirror. And you can see that the weights have been copied successfully. When you have adjusted the weights, you can export them to load them later in the original file with rig. I select all the objects that are deformed by the skin cluster. These are the body, hair, eyebrows, glasses, teeth, and shoes. The clothes are deformed by the deformers. After that, I export the skin pack of weights with export skin pack ASCII command. I prefer to use ASCII to be able to correct the files manually if necessary. At the rigging stage, I have already exported the skin pack weights and I have such a file. I just rewrite it and save this file. I open the file with rig and select the import skin pack command to load the updated weights. You can check how skin behaves. It seems that everything works properly. Now I save this file with rig. You can save it as a new version, but I won't do that. I open the scene with the animation. Actually, it is handy to run several windows with Maya to keep open the rig file, the skin adjustment file, and the animation scene at once, so that I don't have to load the right file every time. The main thing is to not get confused. If you load the scene after the reference file has been saved, Maya will update the reference itself. You can see that the legs now have the correct skinning. If you save the file specified in the reference after the scene was loaded, you can apply the reload command or by right-clicking in the menu on the reference or from the reference editor. Well, now we have a rig with an updated skin in the animation scene, and we can continue to animate. This course focuses more on technical issues and general workflow. That is why I won't describe the entire animation process in detail. I recommend you to get acquainted with the 12 principles of Disney animation. Not all of them are relevant for 3D animation. And also, due to Disney's style, 
but some of them are definitely worth your attention. You should always remember the laws of physics, especially the laws of inertia. As the secondary parts of the body must react to the movement of the main parts, with a slight delay. Heavy objects are slower to change speed and direction than light objects. Don't forget about the arcs. The movements of all body parts should not be linear. Their trajectories should look like organic curves, without sharp bends. Also, the movements should not be monotonous. There should be acceleration or deceleration, higher amplitude or lower amplitude. You should remember that the movements should not be synchronized. Some parts of the body should be slightly ahead of others or delayed. Don't be afraid to exaggerate some movements in order to make them more expressive. Try to make sure that the character's pose in each frame is expressive and easy to perceive. That is, pay attention to the shape of the silhouette. If you're animating a particular shot, it's worth keeping in mind the angle at which the character will be visible in the scene. You should focus on it in order not to do unnecessary work. In general, the main recommendation is to do observation and practice. Analyze the reference. Try to see and then convey the particular movement of the animation. If we talk about the technical side, don't forget about the graph editor when creating animation. It's especially useful for looping animations. Also, it allows you to track sharp movements in the form of animation curves. As a result, after a few hours of work, I had this animation. I slowed it down a bit by increasing the cycle length by two frames. One frame per phase. When you are satisfied with a cycle, you can copy it as many times as you want, in order to match the length of the animation to the length of the shot. I increased the range of the animation, select all controllers, and then select the range on the time slider to include all the keys except the first one. Also, I select the copy command from the right-click menu of the time slider. Then I move to the next frame after the last animation key. I click the paste command, which keeps the copied range with the keys relative to the current frame. After that, I repeat the actions as many times as necessary. Let it be three times, for example, so that the animation has four cycles. As you can notice, the hands behave strangely at the junction between the copied cycles. They are twisted due to interpolation of rotations. You may have a situation where several combinations of coordinates can correspond to one pose. If you look at the curves of the shoulder on the left arm controller, you can see a rather abrupt transition between cycles. To fix this, Maya has a helpful Euler filter function that helps to correct rotation interpolation problems. I apply it and it becomes obvious that the hand behaves normally now. Also, we see a jump on the right hand, although not as noticeable so it's probably easier to apply the Euler filter command for all controllers at once. So we can see that all jumps are gone, and we can move on to the spring setting for secondary movements on the hair, ears, glasses, and jaw. I select the host with the hair attributes, namely this pyramid above the head, now we're looking at the channel box and see that the spring's intensity is zero, and all channels have keys. I don't need animation on these attributes, so I just remove the animation curve on these channels. I select them and apply the delete command. 
Right now I'm increasing the intensity of springs to 1, which is 100%. I click play and now we see that there are secondary movements on the hair. Keep in mind that springs works correctly only in the dependency graph mode. So we change the evaluation parameter to DG in the animation settings. The scene will play much slower because the caching doesn't work in this mode. But since I will be setting up only springs, this isn't that important. Now we see that the amplitude of hair movement is far too large. We can make the springs stiffer by increasing stiffness. We have the stiffness parameters for each joint in the attributes. I'll make stiffness of the first joint, for example 0.8, the second 0.7, and the last one 0.6. You can see problems with deformations. They can be fixed at the next iteration of the skinning. You can also include springs for ears, glasses, and jaw. Their parameters are on the head host. Please note that these components have the same springs parameters on all of them. In fact, by default, mGear combines the attributes of the same components on a host. Sometimes this is convenient because we can control all components with one set of attributes. But in this case, it would be nice to change the springs parameters independently. For example, to make the ears dangle more than the glasses and the jaw. I'll show you how to do this. I need to make changes to the rig. So I save the animation scene and open the rig file. We open the outliner, unfold the group with rig, pull the guides out of the general group, and turn them on to display. Then we open the guides properties and in the animation channel settings group, We enable the use component instance name for attributes prefix attribute to ensure that identical components with different names have their own attributes on the host. I'll delete the old version of the rig. Select the guides and build a new rig. I'll hide the guides, select the head host, and see that there are springs attributes separately for ears, jaw, and glasses. The attributes for all three hair components are grouped together because they have the same name, hair, with a different index. I bind the geometry to the new rig by loading a pack of weights. When I check how the weights are loaded, I see that the character is bound. Don't forget the delta mush in the deformer, which you have to move over the skin cluster when you load the weights. After the rig rebuild, now I group the rig objects together. Drag and drop the guides into a common group, and actually the rig itself. Then I save this file. It's worth saving as a separate copy with the index 02, just to be sure. I open the animation file and... ...specify the updated version of rig in the reference editor. You can simply change the name manually to dickrig2.ma. You can also see that the rig has been updated. If we select the head host on it, you can see the attributes of the new rig. So you can make changes to the rig at almost any stage of the animation when using references. It's important to remember that the animation curves in the animation scene are bound to the rig controllers because of the reference and based strictly on the object names. That's why you shouldn't rename controllers and attributes when updating the rig.
because otherwise the animation will be lost. For example, in this case, the springs attributes for hair in the new versions of the rig have different names. So when you update the reference, Maya can't match them to the previous rig. This happens because they have default values and need to be reconfigured. Of course, it isn't critical for the hair, but sometimes there can be more serious situations. So I recommend you always save it to a separate file when you update the rig to avoid losing the animation. At this stage, we can do one more iteration of the skin cluster weights and fix the deformations on the hair and head. The order of operations is exactly the same as I showed earlier. At first, we do the rig import, then we adjust the weights, export them, and then import them to the original file with the rig. I won't explain this again in detail. When you are quite pleased with the animation, you need to export it for the subsequent shading and rendering of the shot. On this project, all the shots were assembled in Houdini, and we used the Lembic to transfer the animation from Maya to Houdini. Alembic is a universal format that is suited for most of 3D software. It can transfer animation by baking all deformations into point positions. This means that neither the rig itself nor any deformers are exported, only the result of their influence on the geometry. Therefore, the animation is guaranteed to be identical in all software. Exporting is very simple. You need to select all the objects that you want to save. In this case, it's the entire geometry of the character. Then we need to change the cache, Alembic cache. We choose Export Selection to Alembic. Specify the file name. We can specify the range of animation to be exported and also some parameters on the geometry. We'll leave everything by default and click Export Selection. Now we can load the saved cache into the scene. All saved objects appear. I move them to the side. We see that the animation is identical and that it's read from an external file. Keep in mind that Alembic doesn't support materials, so the model is gray after importing. But as I said before, we set up materials in Houdini and use the Alembic only as an animation source.